So last but not least, the final talk in this core part of the symposium will be given by Professor Simon Podner, our head of the Department of Neurology, and also the person who has brought ultra ultrasonography into the field of peripheral nerve disorders in Slovenia. And Professor Podner is also renowned as a fierce advocate of basic knowledge of history and examination and a very rational use of further diagnostic means. So I'm very glad that his talk is actually about an investigation. And let's hear what ultrasonography has to offer and how to use it appropriately. Simon, please take the stage. Okay, so thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I will talk about the role of ultrasonography in uh, polyneuropathies. So uh, ultrasonographies were uh, at the beginning, so that was 20, 30 years ago, uh, first used in focal neuropathies. But nowadays they are becoming more and more uh, relevant also in the field of polyneuropathies. And uh, this is important because we know that uh, uh, a considerable share of polyneuropathies uh, their etiology is uh, unknown even after a lot of investigations performed. So uh, today it is often still a challenge to differentiate between sporadic CMT patients from CIDP patients. Then another problem is uh, AIDP from uh, new onset CIDP patients. And another case would be MMN from ALS patients. And uh, you can find uh, lots of other uh, problems where uh, just clinical examination and electrophysiology will not uh, help you. Uh, so it is also uh, important, not just for diagnosis, but also for, for follow-up of patients with polyneuropathies, particularly if you use uh, some uh, uh, treatments like uh, intravenous immunoglobulins. Uh, so in, it is, uh, there are actually two uh, developments of two methods that are relevant in this field. One is MR neurography and the other is high resolution ultrasonography. I will talk as the title tells about ultrasonography. So uh, in any case, the, we, we moved in last decades, uh, decades just from clinical exam and neurophysiology also to present uh, to imaging of, of nerves. So why ultrasonography? Because it is non-painful, it is non-invasive and it's relatively cheap. But Moitz already mentioned that this is a relevant uh, issue. So ultrasonography examination is also dynamic. It is going on in real time and enables examiner to examine several nerves in a single session. Another important thing is that uh, uh, the, the clinician by himself can perform the investigation. So he exactly knows what he's looking for. So today there was a great development in high frequency probes now we have probes up to 24 uh, megahertz, then advancement in image processing and sensitive dock technology, which uh, enabled ultrasonography to uh, examine also the thinner fibers and branches and to demonstrate even minor structural abnormalities of peripheral nerves. So we, nowadays we could say, as before said, for uh, electrodiagnostic examinations that ultrasonography can serve as an extension of clinical and electrodiagnostic examination. So how can be nerves recognized? So uh, in, in, on transverse view, we can recognize them in, in so-called honeycomb uh, pattern. So the fascicles are darker and uh, uh, this endonerium and uh, perineurium, it's whiter. And if you look them on longitudinal, you will have such a uh, called fibrillary uh, uh, expression of, of the nerves. <coughs> Another important thing is that there are less anisotropic as the tendons. When you tilt, tilt the, the probe just a little, uh, the tendons will become uh, white and black. It will, this will change on very slight tilting, while the nerve will be the same. The, the, the cause is that in tendons, 
fibers within are really parallel and in nerve it, there are it's it's called it, there are fibrillaries it's not exactly they are wavy a bit another thing which help us is also anatomical position with larger nerves of near arteries and smaller near veins so in pathology they can be uniformly on un, non uniformly thickened and you can see this in demyelination inflammation infiltration then individual fascicles can be increased. Then you can find changes in uh, echogenicity, low echogenicity or increased due to different pathologies. So currently the most important parameter is measurement of the cross-sectional area of, of the nerve. So we map the nerves to see, to differentiate between focal, multifocal, generalized pathology then between uniform and ununiform pathology, then predominantly proximal or distal pathology. And we can also see changes that uh, can be either on entrapment sites or on non-entrapment segments. And we can also demonstrate additional entrapment neuropathies in, in such uh, patients. So uh, not long ago, there was a study uh, in which authors asked uh, who would perform ultrasonography in which pathology. And there was asked which, if they would do ultrasonography as the first or if they would use it at all. So when you can see that in all these conditions, uh, uh, these investigators uh, would use ultrasonography, but most of the time that would not be the first method. So this is for some other disorders. So let's talk shortly about hereditary polyneuropathies. So uh, CMT is a very heterogeneous, heterogeneous inherited polyneuropathy. Uh, neurophysiology is very important to make a distinction between the demyelination axonal forms. The most important is CMT1A. Uh, which is the most common and uh, luckily also has the most thickened nerves. And uh, these nerves are uniformly thickened and more they are thickened, uh, more affected are uh, patients and also neurophysiological findings. Uh, it's the most useful is neurophysiology, uh, uh, ultrasonography when neurophysiology don't provide you with any response. So the, the, the nerves are completely uh, gone uh, physiologically. So then is hereditary neuropathy with liability to pressure pulses, uh, autosomal dominant disease. It is actually the inverse of, of CMT1A. Uh, patients have, as you know, these uh, recurrent episodes of compression neuropathies. This is the typical histopathology. And ultrasound uh, shows thickening of peripheral nerves and a typical entrapment sites. It is interesting that although these patients characteristically have increased uh, distal motor latencies, they would not have changes distally uh, on looking by ultrasound, probably because we cannot see these fine distal branches. So these are other forms of CMT, which are not so characteristic as CMT1A. So this is CMT1B, thickened median vagus, but not sural nerves. CMT2, so these are autosomal dominant, so axonal uh, forms. And uh, this would be expected not to thicken the nerves, ultrasonography first. Uh, then CMTX1 is the second most common form of CMT. And the findings are not con is uh, not consistent between different, uh, so it's not clear what what ultrasound can tell us about this. So in the future, we expect that ultrasound will be of use in this situation, uh, particularly when also we have a differentiation between CIDP and uh, CMT. This is just to show you different uh, types of so CMT1A. You see huge nerve. CMT2A, not much uh, smaller in this part. And this is another one, CMTX, HMPP, and this is the control. 
So, of course, it depends where you do. Is it uniform, non uniform? So, and this is also cross sectional areas. You see that CMT1A is, is that one that really uh, goes out uh, of all, all in all measures. But uh, AGNPP has the this risk forearm ratio that means that that they are uh, much larger at risk at the forearm. And interestingly, the CMT1A does not have this. So the, the, it would be enlarged both in forearm and at the wrist. So let's move to inflammatory polyneuropathies. This is probably the area where uh, these uh, uh, ultrasonography techniques are most useful. So histopathologically, you, you will find segmental demyelination with remyelination, interstitial edema, uh, inflammation of the endoneurium, Ultrasonography changes uh, are seen in most patients with CIDP. Uh, typically, this is a non-uniform thickening, and this is a characteristic which uh, differentiates from CMT, particularly CMT1A. So uh, CMT, uh, ultrasound in CMT is very heterogeneous, and you will see differences between individual patients between individual nerves of the same patient and even between different segments of the same nerve. So this is the CMT patient and this is the control. And we usually measure different typical sites. And then you, you can draw this and you see how it's going patient. So usually more you go proximal, particularly for median nerve, thicker nerves uh, become. And this is another uh, uh, showing for the tibial nerve comparison. So this is something from our practice. So the radial nerve of, of uh, the upper arm, you see enlarged. This is the median nerve at the uh, uh, cubital fossa. You see extremely enlarged, but 10 centimeters up, it could be almost normal. So much, much less uh, enlarged. So these are, these, these are other nerves. So uh, a fibular nerve at caput fibulae uh, enlarged. And this is a sciatic nerve uh, at, at the tie. So another interesting thing is uh, this was done by, by a group of Luca Padua in Rome. They, they found that if you follow these patients, you will see that, that the image change. So the nerves at the beginning are very thick and the fascicles are thick and they are hypogogenic. So probably here, this, this swelling of edema is most important. Then some of the fascicles become smaller and they become uh, more whitish, so hyper -echogenic. So it's a, it's a different, uh, I mean, non-heterogeneous uh, pattern. And at the end, you will have a heterogeneous with thinner nerves. So at this time, it is the best to start with therapy so that it does not go into these burned out uh, uh, types. So then we have Louis Sumner, then Dots and Multifocal, and each of them will have uh, their characteristics, the characteristic features. So uh, Matsum, Louis Sumner's, you will have changes at typical uh, uh, entrapment sites then that's you will also have the compression and you will not find uh, distal something special what we found with uh, clinical neurophysiology so this is one very important point that many times the ultrasonography and uh, electrophysiology does not go exactly uh, one with the other and this is the important thing this makes ultrasound important because it tells us something else something new and this this is also differentiation for uh, uh, MMN versus ALS, this uh, multifocal thickening, particularly of the arms. So this is again about Louis Sumner, some, uh, at some point normal or the other point enlarged. In Gelembre, it's typical that you will have a thickening of the nerves proximal, particularly uh, cervical uh, nerve roots. Uh, and then there were several pattern scores. Uh, I will just uh, simply show you. And these scores teach us uh, what I already told you, that 
in GBS, nerve roots are thickened in MNN, MMN, particularly forearms, in medsum, at usual entrapment sites. And then in typical axonal neuropathies, ALS and lumbar stenosis, the nerves will be normal, which is sometimes also an important information. So this is the Bo Bochum ultrasound score. You, you see these nerves at these points and bilateral. And if you have a score of two or more, then it's CIDP. Then you have this to, to, to look at these nerves bilaterally. If it's just one, that's MMN. And then at this point, it's Lewis Sumner. And if it's not, it's either vasculitis or paraproteinemia. And there are some other more uh, difficult scores, more complex scores. This is by, by group of uh, Alexander Green. And you see the nerves that are examined. And these are sensory motor nerves, then a cervical roots and vagal nerve. And there is a sura nerve as a, as a pure uh, sura nerve. And they have similar diagram how to get different uh, diagnoses. And this is comparison between different pathologies. You see CMT1A is the largest, then it comes CIDP, then MEDSUM, MMN, and this is the control. Then I told you already about axonal pornopathies. Most of them will not have uh, thickened nerves, but there can be some surprises. Particularly, it's important that sometimes you see a patient with a low amplitude response and you say, oh, this is for sure axonal. And then you do ultrasound and you say, wow, what's this? This, this is a huge nerve. This should be something else. And most probably it is either some hereditary thing or it is CIDP. Then also you find changes in diabetic polyneuropathy and you will also find some other uh, neuropathies like toxic neuropathy when uh, again, electrophysiology is axonal lesion, but it turns out that there is thickening of the nerves at the treatment sites. So in conclusion, ultrasonography is not useful just in focal neuropathies, but it's also useful in polyneuropathies, especially if demyelination is uh, taking place. So it, distingu it distinguishes between generalized multifocal and focal impairment and between evenly and non-evenly affected nerves. The ultrasound also allows identification of additional con uh, congestion uh, neuropathies, so like uh, TTR, amyloidosis, and so on. And uh, so it is very, very important to do ultrasonography when you don't get the responses on nerve conduction studies. So just for take home message, apart from the main message that if you have patients with polyneuropathies, uh, you should consider also sending them to ultrasonography. Another thing that I would say is CMT1, uniformly thickened nerves, uh, most severely in 1A type, then CADP, non-uniformly thickened nerves and do not so severely as in CMT1A, MMN and, and MATSAM nerves thickened focally, HNPP at entrapment sites, GBS, uh, cervical nerve roots, vasculitis slightly thickening, and axonal, usually not thickening, but uh, be aware of surprises. So thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. We are now moving to questions. The first one has come up. Uh, when to use MRI instead, instead of ultrasonography? Yeah, there are not many indications for that. I think if you would be interested particularly to see uh, very proximal nerves. So we had occasions when you, we saw ultrasonograph, uh, ultrasonographically one uh, our nerve tumor in the middle of the thigh and then MRI uh, showed another one which was very proximal uh, almost uh, within the plexus. So lumbosacral plexus cannot be seen by uh, ultrasonography. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, uh, if you still have some questions and you think that could be asked by, uh, uh, I mean, you, you could get some uh, good answer using MRI 
then you can you can use MRI. MRI can also maybe uh, tell you more about uh, uh, what is inside of the of the of the nerve. So you have different contrasts and you have different other uh, uh, other sequences where you can find, uh, for example, amyloid or or, or some something. So uh, if you have a, a very good MRI. A lab near you, then then it's many times it's it's useful to use. Mm -hmm. You mentioned amyloid. Uh, can ultrasonography help us discover amyloidosis? Yeah, we performed this uh, this study and we found that uh, in in TTR amyloidosis you would uh, have thickened uh, the media nerves at the carpal tunnels, which is not very uh, useful because there are many people that. They have the yeah. same thing, uh, but you also can get the proximal, uh, particularly median uh, nerves enlargement. But this enlargement is not to, uh, usually to such extent that you could, you know, know just only by this, uh, you could get uh, the diagnosis that this is uh, mm -hmm. actually uh, amyloidosis. How about if you have a patient with an unusually severe carpal tunnel syndrome with very bad electrophysiology study. Uh, does it make sense to do an ultrasound? Yeah, of course, because usually usually this is non-localizing. So you can just have a severe uh, affection uh, of the of the media nerves and you don't know exactly is it really carpal tunnel or is it something else. So mm -hmm. in this is this is uh, and and there are other uh, situation for example if you have non-dominant very uh, affected arm uh, then it is larger possibility that you will get uh, uh, things uh, like ganglion cysts or tendinitis and, or other things. So space occupying uh, stuff within the carpal tunnel. Okay. And, so uh, this, yep. sorry, yeah, go on. Mm -hmm. No, and uh, one of the most important indications is, is after failed carpal tunnel release. So this is also. Okay. And this brings us to the next interesting question. Should every electromyographer know how to use ultrasound? Yeah, I think in, in, in the future, uh, this is the, definitely the future. Uh, someone, so some are very enthusiastic about ultrasonography and uh, even surgeons who don't, do, don't perform. One of them said that uh, electrodiagnostics in, in 50 years maybe will be like bloodletting today you know <laughs> because it's painful and doesn't work very well but i'm not i, I don't think so because these are really complementary tests one is uh, telling us about structure another about function mm -hmm. uh, and and there are studies for example in the cidp very recent studies uh, in uh, performed in uh, done in netherlands and they looked for cidp and mmn and how much diagnosis was done by electrophysiology and how much by, by ultrasonography. And actually, uh, there were half of them, they, they, they were diagnosed by both. And then it was a small part just by electrophysiology. And there was about one third that, that was by ultrasonography. So maybe in CIDP uh, might be that uh, ultrasound could be in, 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 in future, the first a method to be used mm -hmm. and after that uh, electrophysiology because it's also it's not painful okay another question how about doppler evaluation is it useful in, in inflammatory pnp ultrasound study what it is what inflammatory polyneuropathy that's uh, how i understand it doppler evaluation uh -huh, in doppler. inflammatory polyneuropathy yeah do doppler is uh, is coming uh, but doppler has still has uh, problems uh, uh, so it is not that we would expect that would be vascularity slightly increased but uh, usually not so you will you will get this in trauma you get in some entrapment neuropathies but no in cidp i don't think so mm -hmm. that that you will and diagnosis. last question, you mentioned uh, nerve thickening in diabetic neuropathy. Can you distinguish this thickening from other demyelinating neuropathies? Yeah, usually, usually in, in uh, 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 actually the, the pattern of changes uh, in TTR amyloidosis on ultrasonography and uh, in, in diabetes is very similar. 
because both are probably also uh, doing on uh, uh, vascu uh, vascular changes. So they, there are small, uh, small obstructions of, of, of this vasa nervorum. But CIDP, so we will have minor changes more in proximal parts of the, of the uh, limbs. Uh, while uh, CIDP uh, will be, uh, if I would have a, a very pronounced changes, I would certainly say, oh, this is CIDP, this is not. Uh, and it is, I think it is useful to, to, uh, to, to make a, you can tell you something uh, uh, about the differentiation between these two conditions, of course. Okay, thank you very much for the excellent lecture.